It is redraft season. Your home league drafts are just around the corner and we are here to set you up with six of the best offenses to be targeting that have massive upside and should be scoring you plenty of fantasy points this season. Let's dive straight into it, Tom. We're going to start at the top. This was the dream offense last year. We put so much faith in all of these high drafted offensive weapons, but they disappointed this year. New QB, new coaching staff. Could this be the year that the Falcons are finally the fancy offense that we dream they could be? This is going to be the year that they do it. And I'm high on Drake London. I'm high on Bijan Robinson. I'm even high on Kyle Pitts. And I appreciate that a lot of people have been burned by Kyle Pitts. I appreciate that people have been burned by Bijan Robinson, taking him at like the 1 2 turn in redraft last year, taking him at the 1 1 in dynasty last year. There's all these points where it's like we've been burned by this offense. But this is going to be different because last year the Falcons were bottom five in pass attempts, they were bottom five in completion rate, they were bottom eight in touchdown rate. But all that's changed because now they've gotten rid of Arthur Smith, who played at a low pass rate. They will run heavy, which reduces the amount of time that you have for passes in the game because the clock's winding when you're running. But now Drake London's coming out and saying that there's been a real coaching emphasis on playing fast this year. Over the course of the last two years, Atlanta quarterbacks, they've averaged 183 yards per game. To contrast that with new quarterback Kirk Cousin, who's averaged 270 yards per game in that spell. Over the past two seasons, Kyle Pitts and Drake London, they've both ranked bottom eight in their position for catchable target rate per PFF. Kirk Cousins, he's at 10 more catchable passes per game in 2023 than Desmond Ritter did. 10, like when you're talking about volume that gets spread around, that is massive. Cousins has been a really accurate quarterback for a number of years. He's particularly good at getting the ball to the middle of the field, which I think is an area where Drake London can thrive. Like Drake London has averaged 4.27 receptions per game through 33 career games. I think you've seen easily double that this year. I think that Bijan Robinson isn't going to come off the field because you've got a new offensive coordinator who comes from the Rams background where they tend to lean more heavily on one player. Everything they've said has been about getting him the ball as much as possible. And then Kyle Pitts can easily have a bounce back year. We know that he was injured last year. Maybe he never turns into the mercurial player that we hoped when he came out. But there aren't that many players outside of these top talents. There's Darnell Mooney, there's Rondale Moore. I even like Tyler Algier for contingent value if Bijan Robinson gets injured. But I just want to have shots on this offense in every single draft that I'm in this year. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think when you're talking, I think quality of, of offense and targets is going to increase, but also the volume, it's going to be fantastic for all three of those assets. We keep hearing, you know, Carl, Poy Carl Pitts is disappointed, but this is the year after the year after, if that makes sense. We had the MCL injury. I don't think he was healthy at all last year. He didn't look like he could move fully. So I'm really excited about Kyle Pitts. And we know that Drake London's kind of underlying advanced stats have been phenomenal since he entered the NFL. The problem is, is that he's not getting the volume or hopefully that's going to address. I think the the one knock I've, I've heard is that, you know, Kirk Cousins is coming off the Achilles. Is he going to be fully healthy? Is he going to be embedded in the offseason program? I get it. But this is a guy that is pretty much back throwing now. And also, let's not forget, this isn't he isn't coming in and having to learn a completely brand new scheme, completely new language. This is the same language and offensive scheme that he's been in for the last four or five years because Zach Robinson is from that Cole Shanahan, Sean McVay tree. I don't think it's going to be anything drastically new for anyone in this offense. So I'm really excited about those three key offensive weapons. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw in Donald Mooney as well as a, you know, particularly in best ball, if you're looking for a, a late round flyer in your redraft league that might have, a, you know, a couple of deep shots in week one or two that maybe you can trade off for a bit of profit. Um, I really like that as a, a potential flyer as well. One other offense we're going to talk about though, Cincinnati Bengals. This feels like this is all in for this year. We talk about, you know, the last dance gets used too much but the bengals are set up on offense for one final year to have this push t higgins is still there they've still got jamar chase 
We've seen they've, they've acquired some additional running back help in Zach Moss and obviously got Chase Brown as well. And then they've they've added maybe one of the most exciting rookies in the draft. Yes, he fell, but that's because he's off, off, off field concerns. Do you think that this offense could be the best Bengals offense we've seen since Joe Burrow was drafted? It kind of has to be because of the reasons you outlined. Like the Bengals are all in now. They reached the Super Bowl and they failed there. And it, you know, failing at the Super Bowl, it counts for absolutely nothing. That's a lost season. You didn't win anything. 15 years from now, so many people aren't going to remember the fact that you had a great playoff run. This year, because they finished fourth in the AFC North, they have the sixth easiest strength of schedule, according to Sharp Football. So the NFL is making it easier for them to bounce back. They've kept T. Higgins. It doesn't sound like the Bengals ever really tried too hard to get a contract offer over the line with him. But it makes sense for him. Like T. Higgins can go back to the Bengals, who look to be competitive, as long as Joe Burrow is healthy. And then he can cash into a massive level next year. If he'd hit the free agent market this year after being injured last year, then it probably wouldn't have been quite as good as it could be if he has another good year. You look at everything else that's going for this offense. Their offensive line is expected to be a top 12 unit. They've got Mike Gesicki brought into the tight end room, who at this point isn't going to develop into the guy who can be truly elite, but he can be a solid role player. You know, he's still got a couple of million guarantee, a couple of million on his contract. And when you look at that tight end room, there's a few different types of players who can be role players. So they can piece that together. They've got Jermaine Burton, who, yes, there's character concerns about him coming out of college, but there's definitely upside too. Zach Moss, fresh off almost 1,000 all purpose yards last year. And then you throw in the fact that this Bengals defense last year was really bad. They allowed the second most passing plays of 20 yards or more at 65. They allowed the fourth most runs of 20 yards or more at 17. So I don't think signing Geno Stone from the Ravens, who had a great year for interceptions, but otherwise couldn't get onto the field all the time. I don't think that's going to solve everything. Yes, they signed Sheldon Rankings, but they also lost DJ Reader. So it's kind of swings and roundabouts. I think that this defense is going to be a sieve at times, and that's going to allow for massive shootouts. And that's exactly what we want for fantasy football. Yeah, absolutely. When when the answer is signing the third safety from the Ravens and bringing back Von Bell, who you let walk two years ago, I'm not sure it's uh, it's expected massive returns on the defense. I really think this is this is one of those offenses that you just want a piece of whatever draft it is. I think it's it's going to put up points. I love the value you can get on Jermaine Burton right now because yes, T Higgins is in that contract year, and if he gets a little knock, are we going to see him kind of sit and and you know rest up and and wait till he's fully healthy to come back? But give me all the Joe Burrow, give me all the Jamal Chase, and you know that I love Zach Moss and Chase Brown. So. Yeah, love love this offense and think it has absolutely massive league winning potential. If you're finding our stuff for the first time, hit that subscribe button down below. We're closing in on 2,500 subscribers. We've got loads of redraft content coming to you, at least two best ball streams a week, and Rich's Dynasty content is all year round. Moving across to a slightly different offense. It's not often we talk about uh, an offense that's got a rookie quarterback under center as one that could have phenomenal upside, but Let's be honest, Tom, this is the greatest landing spot any number one draft pick has ever found himself in. The question is, are there too many mouths to feed in this offense, or do you think they could all produce and this offense could still be elite? I think that's a really good question because I can't think of a situation that even came close to this for a number one overall pick in recent years. So you look at Keenan Allen, who had a Career year in touchdown scored, the second most yards of his career, led the league with 11.5 targets per game. DJ Moore coming off a career year where he had 1,364 yards, eight touchdowns. Roma Dunze, who's coming into the NFL on the back of 140 targets, 1,640 yards and 13 touchdowns. These are all guys who, they are earning volume. They are creating when they've got the ball in their hands and they're scoring touchdowns. So the wide receiver room, for me is incredible and i absolutely much like you talked about with the bengals i want to leave drafts with one of these guys and 
I quite like everything else that the Bears have done. You know, they've brought in new offensive coordinator in Shane Waldron, who's not flawless. I don't think he got the best out of Jackson Smith and Jigba last year. But one thing that he does, though, is he plays fast. He has his offenses playing fast, which is so important. More plays per game, the more chance for fantasy points. In his three seasons in Seattle, they ranked sixth, seventh, eighth in neutral pass rate. They ranked fourth, fourth, and sixth in no huddle rate, according to ETR. So that's a massive contrast compared to the Bears, who over those three years were the second slowest offense. So there are going to be so many more points on offer. Neither of us likes DeAndre Swift. When it comes to the running game, like that's the one area where I can't get on board with him at cost. I'm not interested in Cole Komet either because when Shane Waldron was the Rams tight end coach in 2017, that was when they drafted Gerald Everett with the 44th overall pick. When Waldron left in 2021 to take the offensive coordinator job in Seattle, Gerald Everett followed him there. Now, the third job that Shane Waldron's got oh, look, Gerald Everett's there as well. I don't think Gerald Everett is coming in to sit on the bench. So I think that Cole Komet is a very risky pick at his price. But zooming back out, looking at this offense as a whole, this could be easily the best offense that the Bears have put out in, what, a couple of decades? Ever. The, the Bears have never had a 4,000-yard a, a passer. They've never had a, a quarterback pass with 30 touchdowns. I think it's within the range of outcomes that Caleb Williams becomes the first to do either of those as a rookie. I think that we we can talk up the wide receiver trio as much as you like, but I don't think people quite get this. Roma Dunze absolutely deserves to be in the same conversation of Marvin Harrison Jr., of Malik Neighbors. He's probably the wide receiver one on about 10 NFL franchises, and he's going to be the third, third receiver for the Bears. This is an absolutely phenomenal offense that has got weapons all over the place, and Look, if Caleb Williams just needs to, you know, settle down, we know that he's going to make plays. We know that he's going to be phenomenal out of structure. But as long as Shea Baldwin can keep him pointing in the right direction, I think this offense has huge amounts of potential. And at the value they're going in drafts, I think it's a really good option. But moving from this year's number one overall pick to a previous number one overall pick, the Jacksonville Jaguars, look, Everybody knows I'm a big Trevor Lawrence fan. Everybody knows that I'm going to keep holding out hope because I think he is better than his stat show. Tom, are you are you joining me on the Trevor Lawrence bandwagon? I am, and there's one simple reason. It's the upgraded offensive line. Like last year, the offensive line completely held back the Jags. Like Trevor Lawrence was 17th in completion rate when kept clean. Now, that's not anything to write home about, but when pressured... He was 28th. He just went to pieces. And part of that was because Anton Harrison, the right tackle, who was a first-round pick last year, he didn't play well, but it was first year moving from left tackle. Cam Robinson, who was the left tackle, missed eight games last year. Their center, whose name eludes me, was a liability. So they went out and signed Mitch Morse from the Bills, who allowed only one sack last year. The Jags, they don't often... like They have a habit of messing up some stuff. But these are the kind of things that are going to help Trevor Lawrence take his time by shoring up that against interior pressure. You know, Travis Etienne dropped off completely in the second half, and I would be prepared to give a little bit on my stance that Travis Etienne's a half-season warrior, that part of that was down to the offensive line becoming worse. Calvin Ridley was inches away from scoring touchdowns on a number of plays. Like, if you don't believe me, just go and search on Twitter for Calvin Ridley... <laughs> almost catches like Ian Hartitz has put out a number of videos of it Ridley he ranked 68th in catch rate among wide receivers with 50 targets so it wasn't all on Lawrence it wasn't all on Ridley but with variants some of that could have swung the other way now they brought in Brian Thomas who had a fantastic season with LSU they brought in Gabe Davis who people don't want to hear this but Gabe Davis has had some pretty decent moments and can be a pretty decent role player and particularly within this offense where he's not asked to do too much, I think he'll be fine. But Christian Kirk, I think, can absolutely finish as a top 15 wide receiver this year without too much trouble. So everything's kind of aligning. The AFC South as a whole, is there a single good defense there? Maybe the Texans have kind of got a good defense on one half of the field. But I don't know. I think there's going to be shootouts galore, and I think this is an offense where you're going to want one two pieces from it easily and if you can stack trevor lawrence christian kirk 
I do that in every single league. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've just got to look at the underlying numbers. The Jacksonville Jaguars last year were bottom five in EPA added in the screen game, or bottom five in EPA added in the run game, or bottom five in red zone efficiency, or bottom five in pass block <laughs> room rate. Like, what was set up around Trevor Lawrence didn't help him succeed. Considering what he had around him, he played phenomenally. They've invested in the offensive line. They've added these two new deep threats, which I think is going to create more room for the likes of Christian Work, uh, Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram to eat underneath. I love the call of Christian Kirk. You know, I think people forget last 2022, his first season with the Jagu- Jaguars, he finished as the wide receiver 12. Like this guy has got elite upside. You've now got two deep threats who are going to take the top off a of defense, force teams to play too high coverage. He's going to eat in that kind of speed slot, intermediate to deep range. And I think that, yeah, the, I'm really excited about the potential for Christian Kirk, what Evan Ingram could be working underneath. And I think Trevor Lawrence, we're finally going to start to see the fancy production catch up with the talent and uh, and potential that we all know is very much in there. But talking of offenses with plenty of mouths to feed though, Tom, we come to the Green Bay Packers, one of the youngest offenses in the league. In fact, the youngest offense in the league. But we've got potentially five wide receivers. We've got two tight ends. We've got potentially two, maybe two and a half running backs. Can Jordan Love string it all together and lead this offense as he did down the stretch last year? And could this be the offense to target for fantasy? Well, you say it's the youngest offensively, but it's also the cheapest, which really matters for a team. Like the amount of, like, even adding Josh Jacobs, like, they are still so cheap because there are so many rookies on their first couple of years of contracts. I was pessimistic about Jordan Love. You know, when we talked last offseason, I really found it hard to imagine a player was coming off the bench after a couple of years and was going to be fantastic. But you know, he silenced everyone. It wasn't all smooth sailing. I think there's definitely rose tinted glasses with the way that some people look back at last year's season for Jordan Love. Out of the gate, there were a few bumpy performances. But from week 10 onwards, he was excellent all the way through into the playoffs. Like he averaged fifth most passes per game, the seventh highest touchdown rate, the second highest big time throw rate. These are the kind of things we want for a fantasy offense. Yes. There is a lot of mouths to feed. You look at Christian Watson, Jaden Reed, try to decipher which of those is going to be the wide receiver one. We just didn't really see it from Christian Watson in a big spell. You go back to the year he had with Aaron Rodgers, where he was like, what, wide receiver three over a three-game spell? And then last year, weeks 12 and 13, he was wide receiver 13 and wide receiver eight. But outside of that, he's dealing with injuries. He's really struggling at times but if you put a bit of faith in the reports that they've solved his hamstring issues then potentially you could be looking at a guy with a ceiling as high as any try to decide which of these wide receivers to take is difficult all the way down to Dontavian Wicks and if you're in really deep leagues all the way down to Bo Melton but I think taking a shot on one of them particularly if they fall past ADP is an easy choice to make Luke Musgrave, I don't mind. Like he seems to have quite a defined role as a tight end. But even Tucker Craft, Tucker Craft, somebody that I would be looking to stash. You know, if I've got a deeper redraft league, because from week twelve onwards, Craft was a top twelve tight end in four of the six games that he played. So there is so much talent, and all of it just comes back to Jordan Love is absolutely the type of quarterback that you want to be drafting in redraft, like particularly. If you're in a league that rewards passing volume or touchdowns to a high level, then I would be taking him with confidence every single time. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way Jordan Love played down the stretch last year was absolutely phenomenal. And and people want to say we need to look at whole seasons, not just a, a back half of the year. The issue was was that to start the year, he was pushing the ball downfield at a rate that nobody in the NF- and else in the NFL was, he was taking more risks. Once he actually settled down and started playing the quarterback position properly, that's when he completely took off. And I think, yeah, we, we can take small sample sizes. You can look at first half splits, first, second half splits, and sometimes it can be a lot of noise. But with Jordan Love, you've got to believe it. This is a guy that hadn't played football for a couple of years because he's been sat watching Aaron Rodgers. Once he settled down and started playing properly, 
the ceiling was the roof and and he really took off. So yeah, really excited about this entire offense. You know, I love Jane Reed. I think the way that I, every single thing you read about Dontavian Wicks right now, it's a little bit scary how much he's getting hyped up. The one guy I don't particularly want is Romeo Dubs. I think that he's potentially going to almost play that sort of sacrificial X that we saw kind of like Michael Gallup did with the Cowboys where, yeah, he's an X. Yeah. He's going to have a high target snap share, but he's not going to get the target share. This is definitely an offense that I almost want to see two, three weeks of how snaps are learning out, how teams are playing them, who's getting the targets. And then I'm going to be aggressively trying to trade for the players that are leading it. Because I think as the season goes on, this offense could absolutely blow up. The final offense we're going to talk about though, look, who saw this coming a year ago? We talked about Stafford, we talked about Cup, but now we're talking about Puka Nakua and, of course, Kyron Williams. The Rams invested not in the skill positions this offseason, but they've built up maybe the most dominant and biggest interior offensive line I've ever seen in the NFL. Is it just wheels up for this Rams offense? Yeah, it is, and it comes back to that second point there, that Cup and Stafford are healthy. Obviously, we expect Puka Nakua to maybe he regresses in some categories, but betting on good rookie wide receivers to take an additional jump in their second year isn't a particularly bad idea. Cooper Cup is on the wrong age of 30. We had Dwayne McFarland on the channel recently talking about how his research shows that once wide receivers get past 31, the cliff edge for them can really come quickly. But the way that Cooper Cup wins is still going to translate well enough. And I think that you look at this team as a whole from week 12 onwards last year, things just started to click for them offensively. I mean, Matthew Stafford was playing at a near MVP level. I think if the season had gone on another five weeks, then he would have garnered a good chunk of MVP votes away from Lamar Jackson because he was doing so many things right. Part of that, the one part that a lot of people aren't prepared to listen to is that Demarcus Robinson was a great option for him. He took that wide receiver free role from Tutu Atwell and the Rams play three wide receiver sets at the highest rate of any team in the league. So once Demarcus Robinson had that role, he was out there for like 90% of snaps and from week 13 onwards, Robinson never finished lower than wide receiver 29, averaging 15.4 PPR points per game. If that's somebody that you can get in round 15 of your redraft leagues, that's incredible production. Like, you know, you're talking about a guy who can go into your flex every week and be no problem. The main issue I have with this team is the tight end position. You're talking about Colby Parkinson and Davis Allen, who've combined for 67 career catches across five years of experience in the NFL. There is nothing there that makes me feel confident that they can replicate what Tyler Higby has done. Tyler Higby isn't necessarily a great tight end, but there's points where Sean McVay clearly trusts him. And I think so much of this offense comes back to who Sean McVay trusts. So I don't want to take a shot on either of those tight ends apart from in best ball formats. We had Hayden Winks on the channel talking about undervalued, no valued running backs. And I came away from that conversation even more high on Kyron Williams than I already am. I think if you want to draft Blake Corum as contingent value for if something happens to Kyron Williams, who is a bit fragile, that's fine. But Kyron Williams averaged, what, 21 touches per game last year, was one of only two running backs to average over 95 rushing yards, uh, total yards per game. I think it's wheels up for Kyron, wheels up for Puka Nakua, and I don't mind Cooper Cup as long as he doesn't get too expensive, and I'll absolutely be targeting Demarcus Robinson in every draft. Yeah, I, I love this offense. I think that you talked about, you know, from week 12 on, well, well, what changed from week 12 on for the Rams last year? Cooper Cup got healthy. You know, if you look <laughs> at Cooper Cup last year, he was playing through the middle part of the year injured. And he didn't look the same player. He couldn't get the separation and his fantasy points struggled. As soon as he took a little bit of time out, came back fully healthy, it was wheels up for this offense. From week 13 through the playoffs, you know, Puka Nakua was the wide receiver four. Cooper Cup was the wide receiver nine. Kyron Williams was the wide uh, running back two. 
Matthew Stafford was the quarterback seven. Demarcus Robinson was a t- top 36 wide receiver. Like, I don't care that there's no tight end to be targeting. Give me those two wide receivers. Give me Corin Williams. Give me Matthew Stafford. This offense is so exciting. We know that Sean McVay is an absolute offensive genius. And the fact that they're talking about Puka Nakua is not just going to be sat in his little Z role where, you know, he's going to play those. He's going to get moved around. He's going to get some of those free releases. That's really exciting for what he could be. But it also opens up some potential for Cooper Cup because he's now going to get moved around a little bit more. I'm so excited for what this offense is. And, and yeah, give me all the Rams stats. Give me all the Rams players you can. But that concludes it. Six offenses you need to be targeting in this offseason that have got massive upside. If you haven't, click that subscribe button down below because you are sure to be getting more content as we head into this redraft season.